The title of my presentation, of the paper that I'm presenting, is called The Financial Inputs and the Educational Outputs of IEPs that Really Work for Students. Okay, so why did I write this? Well, an IEP is not only a major investment of school funds, right, but it's also a major investment of professional time. So since an IEP is both a major investment of professional time, which is also money, and school funds, this raises questions of cost effectiveness. In other words, we need to determine if the money we spend on IEPs is justified. And here's the problem. We literally do not know what the results of this spending is. Now, from its genesis, the whole purpose of an IEP was to implement special education law. Right? From day one, that was the purpose of what an IEP was supposed to do. However, over time, this purpose has gotten pretty mired and pretty murky. And today, in 2014, a process to actually monitor the effectiveness of an IEP still does not exist. So, here's what we know. We know that in 2012, the President's Commission on Excellence informed us that the nation's, the national education budget was $360.6 billion. So, of this $360.6 billion that our taxes go to paying nationally for education, of this $360.6 billion, 21.4% of that is spent implementing IEPs. So nearly a quarter of our national education budget is going to implementing IEPs. But we don't have a means to tell if an IEP is effective. And that to me seems crazy. In fact, we can estimate the cost of educating just one child with an IEP. Now this is an estimate. We can estimate that cost at being about $15,468. That's the estimate I got. So, take that $15,468 that it costs to educate just one student with an IEP. Take that and compound it with this statistic. In the last decade, in the last 10 years, which isn't that long, Remember, 10 years ago was just 2004. In the last 10 years, the percentage of students with IEPs has risen 30%. And that is a trend that we have no indication of that it will level off or stop or anything. So just imagine that, that if every, 30, or if every 10 years, the percentage of students with IEPs keeps going up 30%, and the cost to educate just one child with an IEP is $15,468. And just, just complicate that. By the way, the cost to educate just one child with an IEP is also on a steady incline. So there's that incline compounded with the incline in the percentage of students that are getting labels and getting IEPs. Now, public schools spend about two to three times as much educating a child with an IEP as they do educating a child without an IEP. So look around your classrooms if you're teaching, you know, still in public schools, but look around your classrooms. Do you really think that it's fair that we spend two to three times as much on that child with an IEP as we do on a child without an IEP? Well, I'm not here to debate whether or not it's fair. I'm sure some people will say, yes, it's very fair, and other people will say, no, it's not fair at all. But this isn't a presentation on, on being fair as far as money being spent. I'm simply giving you some statistics that, yes, the percentage of children with IEPs has risen 30% in the last 10 years, and, yes, it costs over 15000 to educate one of those children, which is two to three times as much as it costs to educate one child without an IEP. All right, those are just statistics. You can, um, in the paper, you can check my references. You can go back, double-check me if you want to. But those are the stats, and that's where we're standing. So the title of this presentation and paper, again, is the financial inputs and educational outputs of IEPs that really work for students. So, like I said, we don't have a means to measure the effectiveness of an IEP. We don't have that. 
But what we do have are some studies that have shown some, some things that we can do with that IEP that have led to more positive outcomes, or at least in the, when we track these students and these certain elements are present uh, you know, with a certain group of students here and there, at least we have something to say, okay, this process can be effective in some ways if we do a few basic things. Now, that's not to say that we have an effective means to measure the IEP process. What we have, what we found is that if we pay attention to certain elements within that process, we might have more favorable results. So let's talk about that now. Let's switch gears away from the cost and the spending to some things that we could do to maybe make our situations better. Because I think, well, at least me, I don't mind spending money. But what I do mind is wasting money. So we don't really have, we're, nobody here is going to leave and is going to be get, able to go right out and start changing the way our country is spending money in the education arena. So we might as well go out and try to do the best we can do with what we have and put in practice a few basic things within the IEP process that have been demonstrated to lead to some more favorable positive outcomes. Okay, so let's just work down the, uh, the food chain. Let's start out with administrators and what an administrator can do to at least, at least do something with this IEP process to make it more beneficial. Okay, so administrators. We've known for a long time. Well, IDEA came about in 1977, right? The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that came around in 1977. Now, we've known from about 1986 that for this IEP process to be more effective, change has to be made on a building level. So, administrators. Okay, what can administrators do to make this IEP process uh, more effective? All right. Well, we've known since 1986. And remember, IDEA came around in 1977. Okay, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, that came around in 1977. So, I mean, a lot of teachers that are in the classroom today didn't exist in 1977. So it's been around longer than them. So we've known since 1986 that for this IEP process, since 1986, since a year after Back to the Future came out, we've known that for this to be effective, that it has to be, the changes have to be made on a building level, okay? The IEP process has to be implemented on a building level to be most effective, and we've known this since 1986. But instead of that, we've chosen to ignore implementing these IEPs at sort of a building level with this building level approach. Instead of that, we've ignored it for the class-by-class -class modifications that we are still using today. So what do I mean by on a building level? I, I, it, this simply means that we need to free up our administrators. We need to give them the freedom to be able to assemble the appropriate team of, of individuals that can work together and make students' IEPs more effective. I'm simply talking about delivering effective, coordinated, comprehensive services as opposed to class-by-class -class modifications. So we sort of need this whole school approach rather than this eligibility approach. And whenever this whole school approach is put into effect, it's been shown to have more favorable results than simply doing what we do now, right? We test a kid, we label a kid, we put him in a special ed class. Or, or else we farm him out and we include them. We need a more inclusive, more, a bigger approach that, uh, of putting together teams of professionals and handling this situation in a more, I don't want to use the word global, but in a, a much broader sense than what we're doing right now. So what does this broader sense, this, this freeing up our administrators to be able to assemble large teams to actually really address these children, what, what, is that, what am I actually talking about? In the long run, I'm simply saying that we need to handle things because the research has shown that when you handle these, these students on an individual basis, on a case-by-case -case basis, that leads to more positive results than if we handle them as your special ed. Here's your ticket. Go to your specific classes. The modifications are already there. And that's it. it. It doesn't work nearly as good that way as it works when we're able to assemble teams of professionals that will deliver comprehensive services. 
So that's really all I'm going to say about administrators. Now let's move on to the most effective member of the IEP team, the parent. So the research has shown that when parents are present and they are considered an equal give and take partner along with the other educators that are at the IEP team meeting, when that happens, that leads to more favorable outcomes. This is what the research has shown. Now, obviously, you know, when a parent is more involved, if they're more involved in the IEP process, chances are they're more involved in every aspect of that child's life than, say, the parent that doesn't show up at the IEP team meeting. Well, we have no way of really telling what is leading to the more po positive outcomes, but probably a combination of both. So we still don't have that, that means of effectively measuring the, uh, the reliability and the actual effects of an IEP. But what we do have is something that says, hey, if parents are more involved, the student does better. So we need to probably crack down a little bit more on parents that are skipping out on their own child's IEP. And let's face it, it costs two or three times as much to educate that child, to educate their child, who has the IEP than it does the other children in the school. Why wouldn't, when we have to spend so much more tax money on that child, why shouldn't the parent be mandated to be a part of that child's education? So if we're spending so much more on a child with an IEP as opposed to a child without an IEP, and we know that when parents are involved, that child does better, why wouldn't it be mandated that that parent has to be at that IEP team meeting. Shouldn't there be a law somewhere that says, hey, if we're going to spend two to three times as much on your child to be eligible for these special services, we need you to be there to effectively implement these services. Shouldn't there be some kind of law? Well, lo and behold, there actually is. Parents are mandated by law to be at that child's IEP team meeting. If they're not there, they're violating special education law. So maybe, since the research shows that this leads to much more positive outcomes, maybe we should start cracking down a little bit more on having these parents at the child's IEP team meeting. So, believe it or not, the parent is considered the most effective member of the IEP meeting, of the IEP team. Who's number two? The student. So what does the research say happens when students attend their IEP team meetings? Well, the research tells us that the students are more likely to achieve their goals. And they're more likely to improve their academic skills. They're more likely to develop self-advocacy skills. And they're more likely to develop good communication skills. Here's another good one. Students who are part of their own IEP meetings are more likely to graduate. And students that have been tracked after, students with, who have, have gone to their IEP team meetings and been an active part of those meetings and have been tracked after they've gotten out of school, they've been found to have better quality jobs and more, and more employment satisfaction. So there's something right there that we can do to make a difference with the IEPs. I mean, if, if we can't get the parents there, you know, maybe that we can't tangibly get them into the building there. One thing that we really can do that we have control over that we're not doing is having the student be there for their own meeting. And that's not, uh, you know, this school here, that school there. The statistics are between 48 and 64 percent of students attend their own IEP team meetings. And of all those positive outcomes that I just told you of students that have been tracked that attended their IEP meetings, despite all that, we still don't invite them to their own educational meeting. What a huge, huge national disservice we're doing to those kids. And what a huge, huge waste of money. So we've talked about administrators. We've talked about parents. We've talked about students. Let's talk about teachers. And I'm going to skip over special education teachers and go straight to the regular education teachers because there's really just one more fine point that I want to make before I, I close it up here. Regular education teachers and their role in the IEP process. And you know, you can't blame the regular ed teachers for being confused about this whole ordeal. Our regular education teachers are expressing a disconnect, a perceived disconnect between the IEPs, 
between the goals, the services, and implementing whatever they have to implement based on those in the classroom. They don't know what's going on. Right? They, all they view is a disconnect, and you cannot blame them for viewing that disconnect because can anybody up here actually get up and tell me how a teacher is to perceive what happens at that IEP team meeting, number one, if they weren't there, and number two, even if they did go and they read that child's IEP from page one to page whatever it ends on, do you really feel that they are equipped to walk back to their classroom and incorporate what they just read? I would say no. I would say there is a huge disconnect there that you cannot blame regular education teachers for feeling and expressing, and we need to figure out a way to actually infuse all this. We need to figure out what I said at the beginning, what we've known, a way to globally, I don't like the word globally, a way to, as, as a building, deliver comprehensive services to students based on the issues, whatever the issue may be for that child. Not based on a labeling process, not based on, on labeling somebody special ed, putting them in a classroom, and delivering sort of a, a boilerplate form of modifications. That is not as effective as doing it as a comprehensive team. So we need to do that on an administrative level. Parents need to be at the IEP team meetings. It's been shown that we have much more favorable outcomes. We have to get them there. These are things we've been saying forever, I know. But this is a, a big one, and I don't think people really realize the importance of it. And then th students. Students, getting them there to their own meetings. 48 to 64% of the time we don't get them there. That's crazy. That's crazy. We can go right get them out of their classroom. I mean, we take them out for other things. right? This is a big thing to take them out for, and it leads to much more positive outcomes. So whenever I go back and review all this, it kind of sounds like common sense, and it is. But now we know that it's not just common sense. It's what works. And if for a process that we have no real way of measuring, if we can just target a couple little basic things like this and implement them, why not do it? 21.4% of $360.6 billion is a lot of money to waste in any part to waste. So in closing, I just want to say that studies that deal with special education costs they only happen about once every decade. So they're sparse and few and far between, and that makes it very hard to do a presentation or a paper like this one. Because the data is, after you know a couple years, is not accurate anymore. So we need to be able to monitor the cost much more frequently. Also in closing, I just want to say that I'm not up here to uh, criticize funding special education. In fact, I'm up here to pretty much do the opposite. I'm up here to say that it's already being criticized. Um, administrators, researchers, I, just a lot of people in education are, are claiming that special ed is draining their finances away from their regular ed services. So as long as those claims are being made, we need to have a way to really justify the spending on special ed that we're doing. And like I said, it is a big chunk. Also, despite legal mandates, the most effective person at that IEP team meeting is still not coming, right? The parent. Despite being legally mandated to be there, they're still not coming. So that's another issue we really have to try to address in some way. I suppose one way, one thing that might make a little bit of difference in getting the parents there is the parents have also expressed feelings of not being valued as equals at these meetings. So maybe if we start trying to put across, hey, not only are you valued as an equal at this meeting, but we recognize that you're the most important person at this meeting. Maybe if we start doing that on a large scale, we'll start seeing that more parents are going to attend their children's IEP meetings. I mean, it couldn't hurt. All these things that I've just mentioned, they're all happening underneath this big billion dollar umbrella. Billions of dollars being spent. We know we're not spending them wisely. All I'm here to say is, let's start.